a very gentle introduction to large language models without the hype. This video is designed to give people with no computer science background some insight into how ChatGPT and similar AI systems work, GPT-3, GPT-4, Bing Chat, Bard, etc. ChatGPT is a chatbot, a type of conversational AI built, but on top of a large language model. Those are definitely words and we will break all of that down. In the process, we will discuss the core concepts behind them. This article does not require any technical or mathematical background. We will make heavy use of metaphors to illustrate the concepts. We will talk about why the core concepts work the way they work and what we can expect or not expect large language models like ChatGPT to do. Here is what we are going to do. We are going to gently walk through some of the terminology associated with large language models in ChatGPT without any jargon. If I have to use jargon, I will break it down without jargon. We will start very basic, with what is artificial intelligence and work our way up. I will use some recurring metaphors as much as possible. I will talk about the implications of the technologies in terms of what we should expect them to do or should not expect them to do. But first, let's start with some basic terminology that you are probably hearing a lot. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, an entity that performs behaviors that a person might reasonably call intelligent if a human were to do something similar. It is a bit problematic to define artificial intelligence by using the word intelligent, but no one can agree on a good definition. However, I think this still works reasonably well. It basically says that if we look at something artificial and it does things that are engaging and useful and seem to be somewhat non-trivial, then we might call it intelligent. For example we often ascribe the term AI to computer-controlled characters in computer games. Most of these bots are simple pieces of if-then-else code. For example, if the player is within range then shoot else move to the nearest boulder for cover. But if we are doing the job of keeping us engaged and entertained, and not doing any obviously stupid things, then we might think they are more sophisticated than they are. Once we get to understand how something works, we might not be very impressed and expect something more sophisticated behind the scenes. It all depends on what you know about what is going on behind the scenes. The key point is that artificial intelligence is not magic. And because it is not magic, it can be explained. Dot another term you will often hear associated with artificial intelligence is machine learning. Machine learning, a means by which to create behavior by taking in data, forming a model, and then executing the model. Sometimes it is too hard to manually create a bunch of if-then-else statements to capture some complicated phenomenon, like language. In this case, we try to find a bunch of data and use algorithms that can find patterns in the data to model. But what is a model? A model is a simplification of some complex phenomenon. For example, a model car is just a smaller, simpler version of a real car that has many of the attributes but is not meant to completely replace the original. A model car might look real and be useful for certain purposes, but we can't drive it to the store. Just like we can make a smaller, simpler version of a car, we can also make a smaller, simpler version of human language. We use the term large language models because these models are, well, large, from the perspective of how much memory is required to use them. The largest models in production such as ChatGPT, GPT-3, and GPT-4 are large enough that it requires massive supercomputers running in data center servers to create and run. There are many ways to learn a model from data. The neural network is one such way. The technique is roughly based on how the human brain is made up of a network of interconnected brain cells called neurons that pass electrical signals back and forth, somehow allowing us to do all the things we do. The basic concept of the neural network was invented in the 1940s and the basic concepts on how to train them as were invented in the 1980s. Neural networks are very inefficient. And it wasn't until around 2017 when computer hardware was good enough to use them at large scale. But instead of brains, I like to think of neural networks using the metaphor of electrical circuitry. You don't have to be an electrical engineer to know that electricity flows through wires and that we have things called resistors that make it harder for electricity to flow through parts of a circuit. Imagine you want to make a self-driving car that can drive on the highway. You have equipped your car with proximity sensors on the front, back, and sides. The proximity sensors report a value of 1.0 when there is something very close and report a value of 0.0, .0 when nothing is detectable nearby. You have also rigged your car so that robotic mechanisms can turn the steering wheel, push the brakes, and push the accelerator. When the accelerator receives a value of 1.0, it uses maximum acceleration, and 0.0, .0 means no acceleration. Similarly, a value of 1.0 sent to the braking mechanism means slam on the brakes and 0.0, .0 means no braking. The steering mechanism takes a value of minus 1.0 to plus 1.0 with a negative value meaning steer left and a positive value meaning steer right and 0.0, .0 meaning keep straight. You have also recorded data about how you drive. When the road in front is clear you accelerate. When there is a car in front, you slow down. When a car gets too close on the left, you turn to the right and change lanes. Unless, of course, there is a car on your right as well. It's a complex process involving different combinations of actions, steer left, steer right, accelerate more or less, brake, based on different combinations of sensor information. Now you have to wire up the sensor to the robotic mechanisms. How do you do this? It isn't clear. So you wire up every sensor to every robotic actuator. What happens when you take your car out on the road? 
Electrical current flows from all the sensor to all the robotic actuators in the car simultaneously steers left, steers right, accelerates, and brakes. It's a mess dot that's no good. So I grab my resistors and I start putting them on different parts of the circuits so that electricity can flow more freely between certain sensors and certain robotic actuators. For example, I want electricity to flow more freely from the front proximity sensors to the brakes and not to the steering wheel. I start putting them randomly all over the place. Then I try again. Maybe this time my car drives better meaning sometimes it brakes when the data says it is best to brake and steers when the data says it is best to steer, etc. But it doesn't do everything right. And some things it does worse, accelerates when the data says it is best to brake. So I keep randomly trying out different combinations of resistors and gates. Eventually I will stumble upon a combination that works well enough that I declare success. Maybe it looks like this, in reality, we don't add or subtract gates, which are always there. But we modify the gates so that they activate with less energy from below or requires more energy from below, or maybe release a lot of energy only when there is very little energy from below. Machine learning purists might vomit a little bit in their mouths at this characterization. Technically this is done by adjusting something called a bias on the gates, which is typically not shown in diagrams such as these, but in terms of the circuitry metaphor can be thought of as a wire going into each gate plugged directly into an electrical source, which can then be modified like all the other wires. Randomly trying things sucks. An algorithm called backpropagation is reasonably good at making guesses about how to change the configuration of the circuit. The details of the algorithm are not important except to know that it makes tiny changes to the circuit to get the behavior of the circuit closer to doing what the data suggests, and over thousands or millions of tweaks, can eventually get something close to agreeing with the data. We call the resistors and gates parameters because in actuality they are everywhere and what the backpropagation algorithm is doing is declaring that each resistor is stronger or weaker. Thus the entire circuit can be reproduced in other cars if we know the layout of the circuits and the parameter values. Deep learning is a recognition that we can put other things in our circuits besides resistors and gates. For example we can have a mathematical calculation in the middle of our circuit that adds and multiplies things together before sending electricity forward. Deep learning still uses the same basic incremental technique of guessing parameters. When we did the example of the car. We were trying to get our neural network to perform behavior that was consistent with our data. We were asking whether we could create a circuit that manipulated the mechanisms in the car the same way a driver did under similar circumstances. We can treat language the same way. We can look at text written by humans and wonder whether a circuit could produce a sequence of words that looks a lot like the sequences of words that humans tend to produce. Now, our sensors fire when we see words and our output mechanisms are words too. What are we trying to do? We are trying to create a circuit that guesses an output word given a bunch of input words. For example once upon a underscore. Seems like it should fill in the blank with time but not armadillo. We tend to talk about language models in terms of probability. Mathematically we will write the above example as. If you aren't familiar with the notation, don't worry. This is just math talk meaning the probability, p, of the word time given, the bar symbol, means given, a bunch of words once, upon, and a. We would expect a good language model to produce a higher probability of the word time than for the word armadillo. We can generalize this too which just means compute the probability of the nth word in a sequence given all the words that come before it, words in positions 1 through n1. But let's pull back a bit. Think of an old-fashioned typewriter, the kind with the striker arms. Except instead of having a different striker arm for each letter, we have a striker for each word. If the English language has 50,000 words then this is a big typewriter. Instead of the network for the car, think of a similar network, except the top of our circuit has 50,000 outputs connected to striker arms, one for each word. Correspondingly, we would have 50,000 sensors, each one detecting the presence of a different input word. So what we are doing at the end of the day is picking a single striker arm that gets the highest electrical signal and that is the word that goes in the blank. Here is where we stand, if I want to make a simple circuit that takes in a single word and produces a single word, I would have to make a circuit that is 50,000 sensors, one for each word, and 50,000 outputs, one for each striker arm. I would just wire each sensor to each striker arm for a total of 50,000 by 50,000 equals 2.5 billion wires. Every circle on the bottom senses one word. It takes 50,000 sensors to recognize the word once. That energy gets sent through some arbitrary network. All the circles on the top are connected to striker arms for each word. All striker arms receive some energy, but one will receive more than the others. That is a big network. But it gets worse. If I want to do the once upon a underscore example, I need to sense which word is in each of three input positions. I would need 50,000 by 3 equals 150,000 sensors. Wired up to 50,000 striker arms gives me 150,000 by 50,000 equals 7.5 billion wires. As of 2023, most large language models can take in 4,000 words, with the largest taking in 32,000 words. My eyes are watering. A network that takes three words as input requires 50,000 sensors per word. We are going to need some tricks to get a handle on this situation. We will take things in stages. The first thing we will do is break our circuit into two circuits, one called an encoder, and one called a decoder. The insight is that a lot of words mean approximately the same thing. A reasonable guess for all the blanks above would be thrown, 
or maybe toilet, which is to say that I might not need separate wires between the king and throne, or between queen and throne, etc., instead it would be great if I had something that approximately means royalty and every time I see king or queen, I use this intermediate thing instead. Then I only have to worry about which words mean approximately the same thing and then what to do about it, send a lot of energy to throne. So here is what we are going to do. We are going to set up one circuit that takes 50,000 word sensors and maps to some smaller set of outputs, say 256 instead of 50,000. And instead of only being able to trigger one striker arm, we are able to mash a bunch of arms at a time. Each possible combination of striker arms could represent a different concept, like royalty or armored mammals. These 256 outputs would give us the ability to represent 2 squared 5 6 equals 1.15 by 10 7 8 concepts. In reality it is even more because, like how in the car example we can press the brakes part way down, each of those 256 outputs can be not just 1.0 or 0.0 but any number in between. So maybe the better metaphor for this is that all 256 striker arms mash down, but each mashes down with a different amount of force. Okay. So previously one word would required one of 50,000 sensors to fire. Now we've boiled one activated sensor and 49,999 off sensors down into 256 numbers. So king might be 0 0.1, 0 0.0, 0 0.9, 0 0.4, and queen might be 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.4, which are almost the same as each other. I will call these lists of numbers encodings, also called the hidden state for historical reasons but I don't want to explain this, so we will stick with encoding. We call the circuit that squishes our 50,000 sensors into 256 outputs the encoder. It looks like this. An encoder network squishing the 50,000 sensor values needed to detect a single word down into an encoding of 256 numbers, lighter and darker blue used to indicate higher or lower values. But the encoder doesn't tell us which word should come next. So we pair our encoder with a decoder network. The decoder is another circuit that takes 256 numbers making up the encoding and activates the original 50,000 striker arms, one for each word. We would then pick the word with the highest electrical output. This is what it would look like. A decoder network, expanding the 256 values in the encoding into activation values for the 50,000 striker arms associated with each possible word. One word activates the highest. Here is the encoder and decoder working together to make one big neural network. An encoder-decoder network. It is just a decoder sitting on top of an encoder. And, by the way, a single word input to a single word output going through encoding only needs, 50,000 by 256, x2 equals 25.6 million parameters. That seems much better. That example was for one word input and producing one word output, so we would have 50,000 XN inputs if we wanted to read N words, and 256 XN for the encoding. But why does this work? By forcing 50,000 words to all fit into a small set of numbers, we force the network to make compromises and group words together that might trigger the same output word guess. This is a lot like file compression. When you zip a text document you get a smaller document that is no longer readable, but you can unzip the document and recover the original readable text. This can be done because the zip program replaces certain patterns of words with a shorthand notation. Then when it unzips it knows what text to swap back in for the shorthand notation. Our encoder and decoder circuits learn a configuration of resistors and gates that zip and then unzip words. How do we know what encoding for each word is best? Put another way, how do we know that the encoding for king should be similar to the encoding for queen instead of armadillo? As a thought experiment, consider an encoder-decoder network that should take in a single word, 50,000 sensors, and produce the exact same word as output. This is a silly thing to do, but it is quite instructive for what will come next. An encoder-decoder network trained to output the same word as the input, it's the same image as before but with color for activation. I put in the word king and a single sensor sends its electrical signal through the encoder and partially turns on 256 values in the encoding in the middle. If the encoding is right, then the decoder will send the highest electrical signal to the same word, king, right, easy? Not so fast. I am just as likely to see the striker arm with the word armadillo with the highest activation energy. Suppose the striker arm for king gets 0 0.051 electrical signal and the striker arm for armadillo gets 0 0.23 electrical signal. Actually, I don't even care what the value for armadillo is. I can just look at the output energy for king and know that it wasn't 1.0. The difference between 1.0 and 0 0.051 is the error also called loss, and I can use backpropagation to make some changes to the decoder and the encoder so that a slightly different encoding is made next time we see the word king. We do this for all words. The encoder is going to have to compromise because the 256 is way smaller than 50,000. That is, some words are going to have to use the same combinations of activation energy in the middle. So when given the choice, it is going to want the encoding for king and queen to be nearly identical and the encoding for armadillo to be very different. This will give the decoder a better shot at guessing the word by just looking at the 256 encoding values. And if the decoder sees a particular combination of 256 values and guesses king with 0.43 and queen with 0.42, 
we are going to be okay with it as long as king and queen get the highest electrical signals and every of the 49,998 striker arms gets numbers that are smaller. Another way of saying that is that we are probably going to be more okay with the network getting confused between kings and queens than if the network gets confused between kings and armadillos. We say the neural network is self-supervised because, unlike the car example, you don't have to collect separate data for testing the output. We just compare the output to the input. We don't need to have separate data for the input and the output. If the above thought experiment seems silly, it is building block to something called masked language models. The idea of a masked language model is to take in a sequence of words and generate a sequence of words. One of the words in the input and output are blanked out. The mask sat on the throne. The network guesses all the words. Well, it's pretty easy to guess the unmasked words. We only really care about the network's guess about the masked word. That is, we have 50,000 striker arms for each word in the output. We look at the 50,000 striker arms for the masked word. Masking a sequence. I'm getting tired of drawing a lot of connection lines, so I will just draw red lines to mean lots and lots of connections between everything above and below. We can move the mask around and have the network guess different words in different places. One special type of masked language model only has the mask at the end. This is called a generative model because the mask it is guessing for is always the next word in the sequence, which is equivalent to generating the next word as if the next word didn't exist. Like this the, mask, the queen, mask, the queen sat, mask, the queen sat on, mask, the queen sat on the, mask. We also call this an autoregressive model. The word regressive sounds not so good, but regression just means trying to understand the relationship between things, like words that have been input and words that should be output. Auto means self. An autoregressive model is self-predictive. It predicts a word, then that word is used to predict the next word, which is used to predict the next word, and so on. There are some interesting implications to this that we will come back to later. As of the time of this writing. We hear a lot about things called GPT-3 and GPT-4 and chat GPT. GPT is a particular branding of a type of large language model developed by a company called OpenAI. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Let's break this down. Generative, the model is capable of generating continuations to the provided input, that is, given some text, the model tries to guess which words come next. Pre-trained, the model is trained on a very large corpus of general text and is meant to be trained once and used for a lot of different things without needing to be retrained from scratch. More on pre-training. The model is trained on a very large corpus of general text that ostensibly covers a large number of conceivable topics. This more or less means scraped from the internet as opposed to taken from some specialized text repositories. By training on general text, a language model is more capable of responding to a wider range of inputs than, for example, a language model trained on a very specific type of text such as for medical documents. A language model trained on a general corpus can theoretically respond reasonably to anything that might show up in a document on the internet. It might do okay with medical text. A language model only trained on medical documents might respond very well to inputs related to medical contexts, but be quite bad at responding to other inputs like chit-chat or recipes. Either the model is good enough at so many things that one never needs to train their own model, or one can do something called fine-tuning, which means take the pre-trained model and make a few updates to it to make it work better on a specialized task like medical. Now to transformer. Transformer, a specific type of self-supervised encoder decoder deep learning model with some very interesting properties that make it good at language modeling. A transformer is a particular type of deep learning model that transforms the encoding in a particular way that makes it easier to guess the blanked out word. It was introduced by a paper called Attention is All You Need by Vaswani et al. in 2017. At the heart of a transformer is the classical encoder decoder network. The encoder does a very standard encoding process, so vanilla that you would be shocked. But then it adds something else called self attention. Here is the idea of self attention certain words in a sequence are related to other words in the sequence. Consider the sentence the alien landed on Earth because it needed to hide on a planet. If we were to mask out the second word, alien and ask a neural network to guess the word, it would have a better shot because of words like landed and earth. Likewise, if we masked out it and asked the network to guess the word, the presence of the word alien might make it more likely to prefer it over he or she. Words are related to other words by function, by referring to the same thing, or by informing the meanings of each other. We say that words in a sequence attend to other words because they capture some sort of relationship. The relationship isn't necessarily known, 